Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank Hong Wen and uh, uh, all of my hosts for inviting me here to speak, uh, and especially to speak on immigration, which I think is a subject that urgently demands our attention. With the uh, number of unauthorized immigrants living among us in the United States, now estimated to be about 12 million, uh, it seems apparent that we need immigration reform. Uh, the country, however, is bitterly divided over what we must do. For those that advocate comprehensive immigration reform, the changes in our immigration laws must include expanded opportunities for relatively unskilled alien workers to gain legal access to our labor markets. For the economist, the international migration of workers is one facet of globalization which economists understand to mean the development of a global common market. That is our evolution toward a world economy that is integrated across national boundaries. Our progress in this direction has been especially dramatic in the international trade uh, in goods. Economists generally welcome this development, prescribing free trade as the regime that maximizes global economic welfare. Uh, economists also recommend a liberalized trade as a policy that is likely to produce gains for each national economy. Economists also recognize that the same theory that applies to goods also applies to international trade in other markets. Nations can gain not only through the free movement of goods across national boundaries, but also the free movement of labor across national boundaries. The basic intuition for this result derives from the gains from international trade in the labor market. 
we would expect labor to migrate from low-wage countries to high-wage countries in pursuit of higher wages. And as a result of that migration, world output rises. Higher wages in the host country imply that the marginal product of labor is higher there than in the source country. That is, higher wages for the same worker means that the worker produces more value in the host country than in the source country. Labor migration generally leads to net gains in wealth for the world as a whole because labor flows to the country where it has the higher value use. For this reason, economic theory raises a presumption in favor of the free movement of labor. La uh, migration restrictions distort the global labor market, producing a misallocation of labor among countries, thereby wasting human resources and creating unnecessary poverty in labor abundant countries. The larger the inequality in wages between countries, the larger the distortion of global labor markets caused by migration restrictions and the larger the economic gains from liberalizing labor migration. Given the degree of wage inequality in the world today, it should be apparent that the gains from liberalized migration are huge. In fact, some economists have attempted to estimate the gains that the world could enjoy by liberalizing migration. For example, using data from 1977, Bob Hamilton and John Wally analyzed what would happen if we were to eliminate all barriers to migration. And they produced a range of estimates based on various assumptions about critical parameters, but all of their estimates suggest that the potential gains are enormous. Many of their estimates indicate that we could more than double the world's real income. And even their most conservative estimate indicates that the world's real income would rise by 13%. They also found that liberalized migration would reduce global inequality by raising wages dramatically for the world's poorest workers. Using 1998 data, Jonathan Moses and Bjorn Letnes adopt more conservative, conservative assumptions, uh, but even they produce estimates that suggest substantial gains from free migration, ranging from 6% to 12% of the world's real income or from $1.97 trillion to $4.33 trillion per year. Furthermore, their estimates of the benefits of partial liberalization of migration controls indicate that a substantial portion of these gains can be reaped without allowing for full migration, because even small increases in migration could produce significant economic gains, large enough to dwarf those generated by traditional development policies. The World Bank has recently studied the potential gains from such a limited increase in international migration. The World Bank economists consider the effects of an increase in migration from developing countries to high income countries sufficient to increase the labor force in the host countries by 3% by the year 2025. They conclude that this scenario would generate large increases in global welfare, increasing the world's real income by $356 billion in 2025 alone. Furthermore, the relative gains are much higher for developing country households than high income country households, not only increasing the world's real income, but also reducing international income inequality. Would the effects of immigrant workers in the labor market, however, be in the economic interests of natives in the country of immigration? If we examine the impact of immigrants in the labor market, we find that the natives of the host country, taken together, will gain from the immigration of labor. Wages may fall for some native workers who compete with immigrant labor, but that loss for some workers is a pure transfer among natives. It is offset by an equal gain for those who employ labor and ultimately for consumers who obtain goods and services at lower cost. 
Furthermore, natives gained from employing immigrant workers. That is, they gained surplus in excess of the wages they pay immigrants for their labor. If they didn't gain any surplus, they wouldn't hire them. Thus, natives as a group enjoy a net gain from employing immigrants. In fact, the World Bank economists estimate that the high-income countries receiving immigrants in their liberalization scenario would enjoy an increase of $139 billion in their real income in 2025. It's the immigrants themselves, however, who gain the most from their own migration. They obtain higher wages in their host countries than they did in their source countries. In the scenario analyzed by the World Bank, the additional migrants allowed to move under liberalized immigration policies nearly triple their own real income on average, enjoying a gain of $162 billion in 2025, even after subtracting remittances sent back to those left behind in their countries of origin. In this sense, labor migration represents a form of international trade in which the source country exports labor to the host country. Like international trade in goods, labor migration allows foreign suppliers to sell their services to domestic buyers, allowing both parties to gain from the trade. Nevertheless, countries often restrict immigration to protect native workers from the unemployment or the wage reductions that the entry of foreign workers would supposedly entail. In this sense, immigration barriers, like trade barriers, are protectionist. They are designed to protect natives from foreign competition. Protectionists often defend these barriers as policies that promote a more equal distribution of income among natives, pointing to the adverse effects of immigration on the welfare of the least skilled workers in particular. Although the economic effects of immigration on native workers and distributive justice are often advanced as reasons to reduce immigration, these concerns for distributive justice do not provide a sound justification for restrictive immigration laws. First, concerns regarding income inequality among natives do not justify any restrictions on skilled immigration, because skilled immigrants not only increase the total wealth for natives, but also promote a more equitable distribution of income among natives they are likely to have an adverse effect only on competing skilled natives and increase the real wages of everyone else, including less skilled natives who enjoy the benefits of a greater supply of skilled labor. Therefore, the pursuit of a more equal distribution of income among natives would at most justify concerns regarding unskilled immigration, which could have an adverse effect on real wages of unskilled native workers. Second, studies of the effects of immigration in labor markets in the United States have shown little evidence of any significant effects on native wages or employment, even for the least skilled native workers. Given the small effects of immigration on native wages and employment, protectionist policies seem especially misguided. Of course, we may want to prevent even a small reduction in the wages of the least skilled natives, and protectionists may defend immigration restrictions on that basis. Like trade barriers, however, immigration barriers sacrifice gains from trade and thus reduce the total wealth of natives as a group. In this sense, protectionism is a costly way to redistribute wealth from some natives to others. This observation brings me to my third point. We could redistribute the same wealth through tax policies and transfer programs rather than through protectionism and probably would thereby make all classes of natives better off than they are under restrictive immigration policies because immigration produces net gains for natives as a group. Given the small adverse effects of immigration and the small number of native workers who find their wages reduced by the influx of immigrant labor, a fairly small increase in the progressivity of our tax rates would suffice to compensate the few who lose income 
as a result of competition from immigrant workers. Finally, this discussion of the effects of immigration on native workers has ignored the benefits that the immigrants themselves enjoy from access to our labor markets. The discussion has assumed that the welfare of immigrants is of no concern to us. Once we give any weight at all to the interests of those born outside our borders, then we have yet another reason to liberalize immigration. Once we recognize any moral obligation to reduce poverty abroad and to reduce global inequality, we must confront the significant economic harm we inflict on those we exclude under our restrictive immigration laws. Given adverse effects of restrictive immigration policies on the poor abroad, considerations of global justice militate in favor of progressive fiscal policies and against protectionism as a method of addressing any concerns regarding the distribution of income among natives. President George W. Bush proposed that we use a large-scale guest worker program in an attempt to satisfy the large and persistent demand for relatively unskilled labor in the United States that attracts so many unauthorized immigrants. In fact, both the reform bill passed by the Senate in 2006 and the compromise bill considered by the Senate in 2007 would have created such programs. That is, recent reform proposals in Congress would have brought relatively unskilled alien workers into the United States on non-immigrant visas rather than on immigrant visas or green cards. From the perspective of the economic interest of natives, guest worker programs may be uh, an optimal response to concerns regarding the impact of relatively unskilled alien workers on the public treasury. Through such programs, natives enjoy the benefits of these workers in the labor market, but they do not bear the fiscal burden of providing the full set of public benefits that these workers would receive if they had ready access to permanent residence and ultimately citizenship. Although immigrants can gain full access to public benefits upon naturalization, only aliens admitted for permanent residence may naturalize as U.S. citizens. Alien workers admitted on non-immigrant visas are not admitted as permanent residents and are thus not eligible for most public entitlements and are not eligible to naturalize. Our laws generally exclude not only unauthorized immigrants, but also non-immigrants, including temporary workers, from a broad range of public benefits. With only narrow exceptions, these aliens are ineligible for any federal public benefit. Because guest worker programs can give relatively unskilled aliens access to our labor markets without necessarily providing full access to the benefits provided to citizens, these programs may allow the most liberal admissions policies possible for these aliens without imposing a fiscal burden on natives. From the perspective of the interest of the aliens, or from the perspective of liberal principles of justice, however, the ideal policy would provide the option of permanent residence and access to citizenship liberal egalitarian ideals would treat these alien workers as equals, entitled to access to citizenship and the full set of public benefits provided to citizens. This perspective suggests that if we admit workers to our labor market, then we must admit, uh, we must extend the benefits of full membership to them as well. From this perspective, by admitting unskilled workers, we make them objects of our concern and thus worthy recipients of the full set of benefits that we provide to natives. The political theorist Michael Walzer takes such a position, uh, claiming that soci a, a society that relies on guest worker programs to meet its labor needs is a little tyranny. According to Walzer, guest workers are ruled by a band of citizen tyrants. Walzer argues that the disenfranchisement of guest workers violates the principle of political justice in a democratic state. As Walzer states the principle, men and women are either subject to the state's authority or they are not. And if they are subject, they must be given a say and ultimately an equal say in what that authority does. 
Yet Walzer also claims that national governments should have a relatively free hand in restricting immigration. Can Walzer really mean it when he says that all those subject to the state's authority must be given a say in what that authority does, given his views on immigration policy? What about prospective immigrants who seek to enter the United States? Aren't they subject to the state's authority, specifically the state's authority to regulate immigration? Doesn't the principle of political justice stated by Walzer imply that the prospective immigrant must be given a say in what that authority does, including that authority's restrictions on immigration? Yet Walzer also claims that national governments uh, should uh, be free to restrict immigration, uh, free of the principles of distributive justice he would apply among citizens. In such a moral framework, the immigration of relatively unskilled workers poses a fundamental problem for liberals. Ready access to citizenship and all public benefits for a large number of relatively unskilled immigrants would probably prove to be costly for the public treasury. The empirical evidence suggests that unskilled alien workers are likely to have a net negative fiscal impact if granted ready access to citizenship. Thus, if the welfare of incumbent residents determines admissions policies, and we anticipate the fiscal burden that the immigration of the poor would impose, then our desire to serve the interests of incumbent residents would preclude the admission of relatively unskilled workers in the first place. We would refuse to admit relatively unskilled immigrants. This moral stance produces an anomaly. Our commitment to treat these workers as equals once admitted would cut against their admission and thereby make them worse off than they would be if we rejected such a commitment. Walzer would urge us to exclude the alien worker rather than admit that alien as a guest worker. But why should we choose the alternative of exclusion, which makes the excluded alien even worse off than the alternative of a guest worker program? By agreeing to obligations of distributive justice toward them if admitted, we harm them. These aliens would be better off if we agreed never to care about their welfare and never to treat them as equals. If concern for the welfare of poor immigrants motivates generous fiscal policies toward them, then it seems perverse to cite these policies as a reason to exclude the very immigrants whose welfare we would seek to improve through these public benefits. This moral stance is unsatisfactory from the perspective of human welfare. It seems incoherent to turn away the relatively unskilled aliens, citing a negative fiscal effect on current residents, given that we always have the option of admitting that alien subject to restrictions on access to public benefits. This less restrictive alternative would improve the welfare of both the alien and current residents compared to the alternative of exclusion. This admission would also transform the alien into a resident, however. And if we care about the welfare of all residents, then the same distributive concerns that justify generous policies for other poor residents would apply to the poor immigrant as well. This paradox lies at the heart of immigration policy. A commitment to treat the immigrant as an equal can backfire against the alien seeking to immigrate because the immigrant's access to this equal concern does not arise unless we admit the immigrant. If the act of admission triggers obligations of justice, then we can avoid these obligations by choosing to exclude. Indeed, if admissions policies are supposed to serve the interests of only incumbent residents, then we would be obliged to exclude relatively unskilled alien workers. This stance begs the question of whether we can legitimately base admission policies on the interests of incumbent residents alone. Unless the admission decision itself also respects the alien as an equal, the result is perverse. The, thus, the source of the immigration paradox is the contingent nature of the obligation 
to treat the alien as an equal. The problem is inherent in making obligations of justice contingent on admission. We cannot begin our normative analysis by assuming that we don't admit the alien in question. If we make obligations of justice contingent on whether we admit the alien in the first place, then our normative framework becomes a function of our immigration policies and cannot provide an independent standard that we can use to evaluate those policies. We can avoid the immigration paradox if we adopt a normative criterion that is independent of our policy choices. Two options present themselves. First, we could favor the interest of natives and discount the interests of immigrants. This nativist perspective suggests guest worker programs as the optimal admissions policy for relatively unskilled aliens. Second, we can adopt a cosmopolitan perspective that extends equal concern to all individuals, including aliens. Either alternative provides a criterion that is independent of our admissions policies and thus avoids the circularity that underlies the immigration paradox. Only the cosmopolitan perspective, however, uh, is consistent with liberal egalitarian ideals. Only that perspective offers a satisfactory framework for the evaluation of our immigration policies under a liberal egalitarian theory of justice. After all, immigration restrictions discriminate against individuals based on their alienage. Most aliens are born aliens because our nationality laws deem them to be aliens based on immutable characteristics, including the geographic location of their birth, that is national origin, and the citizenship of their parents at the time of their birth. For a liberal society that declares that all men are created equal, this discrimination based explicitly on circumstances of birth is at odds with ideal principles of social justice. Immigration restrictions keep disadvantaged groups of people in conditions of poverty and deprives them of equal access to important economic opportunities. In this sense, immigration restrictions are much like laws mandating residential segregation or employment discrimination in the domestic context. When it comes to racial segregation in the domestic context, we condemn segregation for keeping disadvantaged groups in an underclass, cut off from valuable social and economic opportunities. If we reject such exclusionary practices as violations of liberal principles of equality, then why should exclusion be any more legitimate when the exclusion occurs on a national scale rather than at the local level? Cosmopolitan liberals argue that the principle of equal concern for all, for example, as expressed in the original position in the theory of justice de uh, developed by the political philosopher John Rawls, should extend to all human beings, not just those within a single national community. Rawls asks what principles individuals would choose behind a veil of ignorance where they know nothing about their own personal circumstances or traits. This original position ensures that the parties are fairly situated and treated equally as moral persons. The political theorist Joseph Karens addresses the issue of immigration restrictions in particular as a question of social justice, using a global interpretation of Rawls's original position in which individuals do not know their countries of birth. And Karens concludes that we have an obligation to open our borders much more fully than we do now. Equal concern for all individuals, including aliens, would imply not only more generous fiscal policies, but also more liberal admission policies for relatively unskilled workers than the nativist per uh, perspective would suggest. Estimates of the gains that the world could uh, enjoy by liberalizing international migration indicate that even partial liberalization would not only produce substantial increases in the world's real income, but also improve its distribution. If we begin with equal concern for all persons, 
then immigration barriers are morally suspect and demand justification. After all, immigration restrictions discriminate against aliens based on their national origin, which would appear to be a trait that Rawls should deem arbitrary from a moral point of view. Some political philosophers, however, challenge the cosmopolitan premise that aliens are as entitled to distributive justice under our laws as natives are. Michael Blake, for example, defends distinct principles of distributive justice applicable only within the national context, where individuals share liability to the coercive power of the state. Yet we exclude prospective immigrants through the threat of force applied by the state. And aliens may demand that we justify this coercive exclusion within a framework of equal concern for all persons. Blake claims that the justification we owe to a prospective member of our society would be significantly different from that offered to a present member for the web of legal coercion within which she currently lives. But his claim begs the question, why should the prospective immigrant accept a justification for our immigration laws that does not offer the alien the equal concern embodied in the Rawlsian original position, including a concern, a concern for relative deprivation? Why should we limit this concern for relative deprivation to those currently living within our web of legal coercion? If the claim is that prospective immigrants are burdened in only a minor way by our immigration laws, which therefore require little justification, then this empirical claim is questionable given the significant harm suffered by those excluded from our labor market. Although prospective immigrants do not currently live under all our laws, this fact merely changes the law in question that requires justification. It should not change what counts as a justification. Even if we grant Blake's claim that one must live within our web of coercive laws to be entitled to a concern for relative deprivation, we must extend such concern to the unauthorized immigrant who also lives within this pervasive web. Yet it seems perverse and unfair to give the unauthorized immigrant a right to distributive justice that we do not extend to the prospective immigrant who obediently complies with our immigration laws. On the other hand, if we cite the unauthorized immigrant's violation of our immigration laws, as the reason to deny that immigrant a right to distributive justice, then how are we to respond to that immigrant's demand that we justify those immigration laws first? The philosopher Thomas Nagel suggests that the objection to arbitrary inequalities arises only among fellow participants in a collective enterprise of coercively imposed legal and political institutions. Nagel stresses that we are putative joint authors of the coercively imposed system. But his reasoning would seem to prove too much. Consider a society that permits slavery. Suppose that it seeks to defend its laws by noting that the slaves do not participate in that society's collective enterprise of self-governance and are thus not putative joint authors of the coercively imposed system. If we reject the proposed defense of slavery on the ground that the exclusion of slaves from political participation is unjust, then we beg the question of whether restrictive immigration laws are also unjust. That is, before we cite participation in self-governance as a basis for the right to distributive justice, we must first demonstrate that the restrictions we impose on that participation including immigration restrictions, are themselves justified. Nagel attempts to distinguish immigrants from natives on the ground that immigrants seek to associate with us voluntarily, whereas natives are born into our society and have no choice. The political philosopher Joseph Heath draws a similar distinction, 
arguing that involuntarily incurred obligations must meet a much higher standard in order to be considered binding. These suggestions seem to turn liberalism on its head, insofar as they entitle uh, natives in rich countries to advantages based on immutable circumstances of birth. These claims seem to fly in the face of reality when those born in rich countries cite the circumstances of their birth as if it were some sort of disadvantage, justifying privileges not extended to those born in poor countries who seek to move voluntarily into those rich countries. After all, those born in poor countries involuntarily incur poverty and the legal obligation to comply with the immigration laws of rich countries. A view more sensitive to social, legal, and economic realities would recognize the claims of prospective immigrants based on all the burdens they have involuntarily incurred. The claims advanced by Nagel and Heath assume that natives are not free to emigrate and therefore they reside involuntarily in their country of origin. Heath argues that the costs associated with emigration are so high that nationality is de facto involuntary, conceding that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary is determined by some notion of which options an individual could reasonably be expected to recognize, uh, be expected to exercise. Once we recognize, however, that the difference between involuntary residence and voluntary migration is not only a matter of degree, but also a question of what options we should deem reasonable then the claims advanced by Nagel and Heath beg the question, should we regard residence in a poor country to be so costly as to make it unreasonable for us to expect the prospective migrant to refrain from migrating to a rich country? My claim is that liberal ideals would require our immigration policies to extend equal concern to all those affected just as our laws in the domestic context should be based on equal concern. This equal concern should include a concern for relative deprivation and for fairness in the distribution of social and economic goods and opportunities. I argue that attempts by some political theorists and philosophers to distinguish immigration policies from laws in the domestic context in this regard are all ultimately question begging. I conclude that considerations of distributive justice suggest that liberal states should seek to liberalize their immigration policies, thereby reducing global inequalities in economic opportunity. This suggestion does not imply that liberal states must throw open their borders overnight, but I do mean to suggest that we should liberalize our immigration restrictions and that we should continue to liberalize over time unless and until further liberalization would pose risks substantial enough to outweigh the important interests of immigrants in equal access to economic and social opportunities. It is incumbent upon all liberal states to pursue such reforms if they are to remain faithful to the egalitarian ideals that they espouse. The problem with the cosmopolitan escape from the immigration paradox is the failure of most citizens to adopt such a cosmopolitan perspective. Given this failure, cosmopolitan liberals face constraints of political feasibility that prevents realization of all their ideals. As a matter of political reality, the interests of citizens have in fact played the dominant role in the public debate over immigration policies. This feature of the real world may impose a constraint on the set of policy alternatives open to us as a practical matter. The cosmopolitan liberal would prefer that aliens have access to both our labor market and to public benefits and citizenship. As a matter of political reality, however, citizens are unlikely to admit aliens under those generous conditions 
in the numbers that cosmopolitan ideals would require, given the fiscal burden that those, uh, those liberal policies would entail. As long as citizens are reluctant to bear the fiscal burdens that cosmopolitan liberalism would impose, they are likely to restrict access to permanent residence. Given these constraints, cosmopolitan liberals face a trade-off, significantly liberalized access to our labor markets for unskilled alien workers will likely require some restrictions on alien access to public benefits and to citizenship to have a realistic chance of enactment. Under these circumstances, guest worker programs may represent the only alternative to exclusion for many aliens. Well, how should we design a guest worker program with all these considerations in mind? Past programs, including the Bracero program, tied each guest worker to a specific employer. Guest worker programs, however, don't have to limit the worker's mobility in this way. Freedom to leave an employer and to take employment elsewhere would give workers greater power to assert their rights against employers and thus prevent abuses without destroying the economic gains that natives enjoy from employing alien workers. In fact, the bill passed by the Senate um, in 2006 would have allowed guest workers to change employers. The portability of the guest worker's visa allowed the bill to win the support of Hispanic groups, like La Raza. An ideal program would offer the guest worker full mobility, including the ability to move freely among various sectors of the economy. Complete mobility, not only among different employers, but also among different sectors of the U.S. economy, would give workers full freedom to change jobs, and to obtain the highest wages and best working conditions available. This mobility would be best not only for the guest worker, but also for the efficiency of the labor market, because it would allow the supply of labor to shift among sectors in response to changing market demand. Once guest workers are free to seek any job in the United States, then all sectors of the U.S. economy can benefit from hiring them. Critics of guest worker programs commonly complain that guest workers often prefer to stay permanently and that it can be difficult to ensure that these workers leave. One response is to make sure that a new guest worker program has better incentives for workers to return home. Perhaps the United States government could withhold a fraction of their wages to be paid only once the guest worker returns to the home country. We could also accommodate the desire of guest workers to remain by lifting restrictions on the duration of a guest worker's residence and employment in the United States. As long as we restrict their access to public benefits, they seem unlikely to impose a net fiscal burden on the public treasury. Thus, we could uh, allow guest workers to renew their non-immigrant visa and stay as long as they wish. Such a program, however, raises the prospect of de facto permanent residence with only restricted access to citizenship and to public benefits. To better reflect democratic ideals, we could offer a path to citizenship for guest workers who compile a record of employment and avoid criminal activity. For example, the bill passed by the Senate in 2006 would have given guest workers the opportunity to earn a path to permanent status and ultimately citizenship. Thus, admission as a guest worker need not entail permanent status as an alien. But would access to citizenship for low-skilled workers raise the prospect of a fiscal burden, which after all inspired the suggestion of a guest worker proposal in the first place? Well, not necessarily. By requiring guest workers to spend some years in non-immigrant status first, we delay their access to the full set of public benefits that we provide to citizens. 
this delay itself would improve the fiscal impact of each low-skilled immigrant. The longer the delay, the greater the improvement in the immigrant's fiscal impact. Empirical evidence indicates that we could allow even a relatively unskilled immigrant to naturalize without imposing a net fiscal burden if a sufficient period of alienage with limited access to public benefits has passed. We could also require guest workers to have paid a sufficient amount in taxes before they could adjust their status to ensure that those who adjust status are likely to have a net positive fiscal impact. In reality, access to citizenship is a matter of degree. Guest workers might have the opportunity to adjust status only after a short period of residence or only after a long period. We might demand a long work history and a large amount of taxes paid, or we could impose less stringent requirements. We could choose any point along this continuum to satisfy critics concerned about the fiscal impact of low-skilled immigrants or the political impact of their naturalization and participation in the electorate. In fact, the 2007 bill considered by Congress would have given guest workers the opportunity to apply for permanent residence through a points system and would have awarded some points for years of U.S. work experience. By adjusting the points awarded for work experience as a guest worker, or by awarding points for taxes paid, and by adjusting the total number of immigrant visas issued, we can adjust the guest worker's prospects for permanent residence and the number of years that a guest worker could expect to wait to adjust status. From a cosmopolitan perspective that extends equal concern to aliens and natives, expanded guest worker programs would represent an improvement over the status quo alternative of exclusion. Therefore, cosmopolitan liberals should support liberalizing reforms that include guest worker programs, even while seeking the broadest rights possible for aliens within the constraints of political feasibility. While it would be a mistake to pretend that this compromise is ideal from a liberal egalitarian perspective, it would also be a mistake to sacrifice worthwhile reforms because they fall short of the ideal. Thank you. Professor Chang will be uh, happy to take questions. Uh, there should be a couple of uh, people with uh, the portable microphones. And if you would wait, if you want to ask questions, if you would wait then uh, for the person to bring the microphone over. Hi, Dr. Chang. Thank you for the lecture. So the first question mentioned um, this one of more liberal immigration law. Have you, in your research or seen other research that study what the fiscal impact exactly would be? And um, in your eyes, less generous fiscal Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the best work done on this question uh, was done by the National Research Council. Uh, and they found that the average immigrant under current policies has a net positive fiscal impact once you take into account the impact of that immigrant's descendants as well as the fiscal impact of the immigrant. Um, that uh, makes the average impact positive because uh, the immigrant's descendants tend to do better in, in terms of socioeconomic status than the immigrant uh, himself or herself. Uh, with uh, uh, higher socioeconomic status comes higher income, uh, uh, a larger amount in taxes paid, uh, and, and so taking into account uh, the effects of the children of immigrants and their descendants uh, turns out to be critically important in getting an accurate picture of the fiscal effect of, uh, of each immigrant. 
Now, the fact that the average immigrant has a net positive fiscal impact uh, uh, doesn't necessarily imply that every immigrant will have a net positive uh, impact. Uh, in particular, once they broke down immigrants into different groups um, based on education, uh, they found that the average immigrant with less than a high school education uh, would be protect, uh, uh, predicted to have a net uh, negative fiscal impact, uh, albeit a, a modest negative uh, impact. Uh, and, and that's the um, empirical evidence that I'm relying on for the suggestion that uh, uh, very liberal immigration policies for the least skilled alien workers uh, would have a negative fiscal impact if they had ready access to public benefits. Now, in part, uh, the numbers that the National Research Council produced uh, reflects policies of restric restricting public access, I mean, uh, restricting immigrant access to public benefits. Uh, in particular, uh, their numbers include uh, unauthorized immigrants who have very little access to public benefits uh, and therefore are, are li quite likely to have a net positive fiscal impact given the severe restrictions imposed on their access to public benefits. Um, uh, their numbers, uh, however, uh, were based on data uh, before 1996. In 1996, Congress adopted still more severe restrictions on uh, immigrant access to public benefits, so it's likely that uh, the numbers the National Research Council came up with uh, actually understate the fiscal benefits of, uh, of immigration. Uh, but I think it is, uh, it is uh, clear that one response you can take towards uh, the threat of a fiscal burden is not to restrict admission, but instead uh, to restrict access to the public benefits to the extent that that is, uh, that is the concern. Well, I think that uh, uh, what has made, uh, one of the things that has made uh, the economy of the United States so successful uh, is its openness to immigration. Um, that the United States has traditionally thrived on uh, attracting uh, uh, the best and brightest uh, that the world has to offer uh, to its universities and ultimately to its labor market. Um, but that the United States has thrived by not only attracting those uh, uh, highly educated immigrants, uh, but also by uh, attracting uh, less educated immigrants. And they all contribute to the economy uh, through their labor uh, and uh, uh, the, by producing value in the, in the labor market. And, and I think uh, restrictions will, uh, will harm the U.S. economy. <coughs> Well, I, uh, you're, you're, you're referring to unauthorized immigrants? Uh, uh, they are um, disproportionately uh, less skilled compared to uh, legal immigrants or, or compared to the native population. Now, that's not to say uh, most of them are uh, of low skill, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I th believe the numbers are uh, 
uh, perhaps something approaching half of them have uh, less than a high school education. And this reflects our immigration policies, of course. Uh, we make it uh, uh, relatively easy to immigrate if you are skilled and uh, have uh, uh, many years of education. Uh, we make it quite difficult to immigrate uh, if you um, have less education. Uh, and, and so the reason that uh, uh, unauthorized uh, immigrants are disproportionately of uh, uh, low education and, and uh, lower skills is, is, is the reflection of our selective immigration policy. Well, uh, what I had in mind uh, are the sort of policies we already have in place that restrict uh, access to uh, uh, certain public benefits uh, for those on non-immigrant visas or uh, those who are unauthorized immigrants. That doesn't include public schools. Uh, 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 even unauthorized immigrants have a right to uh, attend public schools, and I think that's uh, a good policy, uh, given that uh, uh, most unauthorized immigrants will remain uh, in our society, it's in our interest to see that they are educated. Uh, the same thing goes for certain uh, uh, health care services. Uh, it's important for public health purposes to see that everybody's immunized, that everybody receives treatment for communicable diseases. Um, uh, there are sound public health reasons for providing access to uh, health services to everybody. Um, uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, we restrict access for uh, some health services that I think would be um, even in the interests of natives to provide to, uh, uh, to uh, all immigrants. Um, that would include uh, prenatal care, for example, um, which uh, would probably prevent uh, more costly uh, health problems later uh, than, uh, than the prenatal care itself would cost. Um, but in general, uh, I think uh, your point is well taken. Uh, we have to be cautious about exactly what public benefits we're talking about. Um, uh, even if you're concerned only with the interests of natives, there are various services you would want to provide immigrants, um, uh, not necessarily uh, for their benefit if you're solely concerned with the interests of natives, but for the interests of, of, of natives as well. Um, uh, so uh, that, uh, that said, um, uh, it's, um, I think, uh, perhaps going to be uh, critical that some sort of restriction on public benefits uh, be imposed for at least some time uh, if we're going to get uh, uh, a, a liberal enough policy to help uh, large numbers of relatively unskilled alien workers. Other questions? Um, so, on behalf of the uh, University of Scranton, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Chang for having <laughs> delivered a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes the uh, event uh, today. Thank you.